Take a look at the vertebrae in this image. From the first session, you should be able to identify certain characteristics common to each, but you don't have to look too hard to recognize some major differences as well. In the first session, we described a typical vertebrae, but the truth is, there's no such thing. As we move down the vertebral column, vertebrae don't just get bigger, they also take on different morphologies that suit their regional functions. These morphological differences are the focus of the second session. Welcome back to the second session on the vertebral column. Having discussed the structure of a typical vertebrae, we now turn our attention to the structural differences between these regions. Our learning objectives for this session are to distinguish between the five principal types of vertebrae and learn how to classify a given vertebrae based on its morphological characteristics. Second, we'll take our first look at radiographic images, a branch of medicine that will become critically important to many of you in your future careers and give you some experience with identifying the morphological structures of these vertebrae in radiographs. We'll begin with an examination of the cervical vertebrae. Characteristics of most cervical vertebrae include small, oval-shaped bodies with a complementary concave superior surface and convex inferior surface to maximize surface area contact. Bilaterally, the concave surface culminates in bony crests known as uncinate processes. In addition to the fibrous intervertebral joints that will be discussed later, the uncinate processes form synovial uncovertebral joints found only in the cervical region. Because of the small size of the vertebral body and proportionally large size of the vertebral foramen, the pedicles are directed more laterally than is seen in other regions of the vertebral column. The processes of a cervical vertebrae tend to take on a bifid appearance. The bifurcation of spinous processes is variable, commonly found in some racial groups, but not others. This observation assists in body identification in forensic medicine. Most prominent is the C7 spinous process, often referred to as the vertebral prominence. As the name implies, it's the most prominent superficial structure at the back of the neck and provides an important landmark for identifying and counting vertebrae. The bifurcation in the transverse processes is more universal, forming the anterior and posterior tubercles for muscle attachment. Probably the most prominent distinctive feature of the cervical vertebrae is the foramen transversarium, an opening found within the transverse processes of all cervical vertebrae. The vertebral artery passes through the foramen of the first six vertebrae, while the vertebral vein passes through the foramen at all vertebral levels. Although not readily visible in these images, it is also important to appreciate that the joints made by the superior and inferior articulating processes lie in an oblique plane, running from anterosuperior to posteroinferior. Here we see an AP view of the cervical spine. Note the superior concave and inferior convex surfaces and the presence of the uncinate processes. The transverse processes are also prominent in this view. Although the foramen transversarium are not generally identifiable, we can make them out in this vertebrae as a shadow within the transverse process. The pedicles appear as bilateral circles resembling eyes. The spinous processes lie along the mid-sagittal line. Generally speaking, only the C7 and C6 spinous process are prominent due to the radiolucent shadow created by the trachea. Also note that very little detail of C1 through C3 is available in this view due to the masking effect of the mandible, which lies directly anterior to this point. In the lateral view, we can clearly make out the vertebral bodies in their anterior and posterior boundaries. Although there is curvature in this region, all vertebrae should fall within a continuous line. Deviation from this line is often indicative of an anteroposterior malalignment. Note that the posterior line defines the anterior border of the vertebral foramen. In each vertebral arch, we see a dark circle indicating the fusion of the lamina. This defines the posterior border of the vertebral foramen. The space between this line and the posterior line of the vertebral artery represents the anteroposterior length of the vertebral foramen. <laughs> 
Within this region, we can also define the pars interarticularis and the superior and inferior articulating facets. Note, as described previously, the oblique plane of the joint space between the articulating facets. Before we can leave the cervical region, we must give special consideration to two special vertebrae, C1 and C2. Their structure is unique among the cervical vertebrae. C1 is also known as the atlas due to the fact that it supports the weight of the occiput, similar to how the mythological character supports the weight of the world on his shoulders. In looking at C1, observe that there is no vertebral body. Instead, we define both an anterior and posterior arch, containing anterior and posterior tubercles for muscle attachment. The lateral masses are formed by the superior and inferior articulating facets and the pars interarticularis. C2 is also known as the axis due to the fact that the atlas rotates around it, as we will see later. The most striking feature of C2 is the bony process that extends from the superior surface of the C2 body, known as the dens or odontoid process, which serves as the pivot point for rotation with the atlas. As previously observed, AP radiographic views of the atlantoaxial region are hindered by the presence of the mandible. For a clear radiographic view of the atlas and axis, an open mouth radiographic image is taken, with the mandible depressed. In this view, the odontoid process is distinct. Surrounding the odontoid process, the radiolucid anterior and posterior arches of C1 can be faintly observed. We can also see the wedge-shaped lateral masses and the joint space between the superior and inferior articulating surfaces of the axis and atlas, respectively. This brings us to the thoracic vertebrae. The bodies of the thoracic vertebrae are more heart-shaped than oval and of relatively greater size when compared to the vertebral foramen. These vertebrae also feature long, slender spinous processes that project inferiorly, the tip lying in line with the vertebral body of the inferior vertebrae. Also note that the inferior and superior articulating surfaces are directed anteriorly and posteriorly, respectively, such that the joint space lies in a coronal plane. Finally, a number of facets for bone articulations can be identified. Transverse facets lie on the anterior surface of the tip of the transverse process for articulation with the angle of the rib. On the vertebral bodies, an articular surface is shared by adjacent vertebrae for articulation with the head of the rib, spanning the thickness of the intervertebral disc. We can therefore divide this articulation surface into two for discussion the inferior coastal demifacet on the superior vertebrae and the superior coastal demifacet on the inferior vertebrae. Note that the term demi means half, indicating half of the articulating surface. For the majority of coastal articulations, the head of the rib articulates with two adjacent vertebrae through the superior and inferior demifacets. There are a couple of notable exceptions, however. In the case of the articulation between the first rib and T1, the articulating surface is entirely associated with the T1 vertebrae. Seeing as this is a full articulation, it is appropriate to use the term facet rather than demi-facet in this instance. A similar situation is observed with the 10th, 11th, and 12th rib. The articulating surface shifts down such that T9, 10, 11, and 12 lose their inferior demifacet, and the 10th, 11th, and 12th rib articulate exclusively with the 10th, 11th, and 12th vertebrae. Again, we refer to these as full facets rather than half demifacets. Adding the rib into the picture, we can see how each rib articulates with the vertebrae it shares its name with. Remember that, in the case of ribs 2 through 9, they also articulate with the inferior demifacet of the upper vertebrae. Here we see a radiographic view of the thoracic vertebrae. Here we outlined the ninth thoracic vertebrae. As with the cervical vertebrae, the pedicles are readily apparent, as is the spinous process. Also note the head and tubercle of each rib and how they articulate with the bodies and transverse processes of each vertebrae, respectively. Also note that the head region actually articulates with two separate and adjacent vertebrae in each of these examples. Lumbar vertebrae are found in the lower back. They have large drum-shaped bodies which are slightly wedge-shaped, accounting for the normal curvature in this region. 
We also see a change in the architecture of the superior and inferior articulating facets, which face medially and laterally, respectively. As a result, the joint spaces lie in a mostly parasagittal plane. There are also distinct bony processes found only in the lumbar region that serve as places for muscular attachment. The axillary process is found at the base of the transverse processes, while the mammillary process is found on the posterior non-articulating portion of the superior articulating facet. Taking a look at an AP radiograph of the lumbar spine, we can again identify the vertebral body, pedicles, spinous, and transverse processes, in this case associated with the fourth lumbar vertebrae. We can also quite easily observe the pars interarticularis and superior and inferior articulating facets in this view. This creates what is commonly referred to as a butterfly image, where the mid-region of the wings represents the pars interarticularis and the upper and lower portions of the superior and inferior articulating facets, respectively. Because the facet's surfaces are oriented more medial-lateral, we can just make out the joint space between adjacent butterflies. We'll talk more about these specific joints in the next session. The lateral radiograph gives us more of the same information with an unobstructed view of the vertebral bodies. This is important in examinations for compression fractures and disc injuries. We can also see a clear view of the individual intervertebral foramen in this picture. Note that, because of their orientation, the joint space between the superior and inferior articulating facets is no longer distinct in the lumbar region compared to what was seen in the cervical region. Before we leave lumbar spine radiography, there's one final view we should discuss. As with the previous spinal regions, it's common to take anteroposterior images to look at the vertebrae head-on, as well as lateral images to look at the vertebrae from the side. In the lumbar region, it's also common to take the oblique images to view the vertebrae at 45 degree angles. This provides us with a unique view of the pars interarticularis. Earlier, we talked about the butterfly appearance in the AP view. Well, what you'll come to realize is that radiologists like to find pictures in a lot of the images they take. Sort of like finding shapes in clouds, really. In this case, we can discuss the infamous Scotty Dog sign, so named because of the image's resemblance to this particular animal. Here you can see the transverse process making up the nose, the ipsilateral pedicle making up the eye, the ipsilateral superior articulating process making up the ear, while the contralateral superior articulating facet makes up the tail, and the two inferior articulating facets make up the front and back legs. Note the neck region, which represents the ipsilateral pars interarticularis. Keep this in mind because we'll be returning to it during the fourth session on clinical presentations. Moving down the column, we next encounter the sacral vertebrae. The sacrum is composed of five fused vertebrae identified as S1 through S5. As previously discussed, these vertebrae become progressively smaller in size, creating an inverted pyramid shape that dissipates forces into the lower limbs. The auricular surface is found superolaterally. It is an uneven articular surface that roughly resembles an ear, giving it its name. The auricular surface articulates with the pelvic bone, connecting the axial skeleton to the lower limbs. Although it's considered a synovial joint, the uneven joint surfaces permit very little movement within this joint. The anterior pelvic surface is smooth and concave, while the convex posterior surface is roughened with a number of prominent bony ridges. The median crest lies in the mid-sagittal plane and is formed by the fusion of the sacral spinous processes. The median crest terminates around the level of S4, leaving an opening known as the sacral hiatus. Further out, bilaterally, we see the medial sacral ridges formed from the fusion of the articulating processes. These ridges terminate in two horn-like processes, the sacral cornu, which serve as landmarks for identifying the sacral hiatus. Laterally, we see the lateral sacral ridges formed from the fusion of the transverse processes. A series of anterior and posterior sacral foramen permit the transmission of anterior and posterior nerve branches, respectively. The coccyx is formed by a series of three or four vestigial bones, the remnants of a primordial tail structure. It serves little in terms of structural support, but is an important bony anchor for muscular attachment. Coccygeal fractures from falling on one's backside are relatively common, 
While normal anatomical function is minimally affected, activities requiring contraction of the pelvic musculature can be incredibly painful due to the stresses placed on the fractured bone. Although rare, variations in the number of sacral vertebrae exist. In some individuals, the lowest of the lumbar vertebrae, L5, is either partly or fully fused to the first sacral vertebrae, resulting in a condition known as L5 sacralization. In other individuals, the S1 vertebrae is unfused and functionally separate from the remainder of the sacrum, a condition known as S1 lumbardization. It's often been thought that either condition may predispose individuals to back pain later in life, although more recently it's now hypothesized that the identification of either condition in a radiological series may be coincidental to the true source of back pain. In other words, we just happen to find these variants by chance in people with back pain for other reasons. That concludes the second session on the vertebral column. In the third installment, we'll be putting the individual pieces together and looking at the vertebral column as a whole. For now, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy your break.